I still believe that gold will be $3,000 an ounce uh, by the end of this year. So we're talking about months, not years away. Right now, the gold price to silver price ratio is somewhere in the 75 plus to one range. Mm -hmm. In a bull market, uh, when the precious metals are running, typically the gold price to silver price ratio goes down to 40 to one, which means that if gold is at $3,000 an ounce, silver is easily north of $100. Okay. And what's driving that is uh, what concerns me, which is significant inflation and excesses in the markets generally, in the economy generally, as a result of over a dozen years of increased money supply. That's resulting in uh, really extended valuations in the general equity markets and significant inflation. And we've seen headline numbers now in inflation approach 40 year highs. And I would say that significantly understates the reality on the ground. Um, if you're buying food, if you're buying fuel, if you're putting a roof over your head, it's not single digit, seven and a half percent inflation. It's deeply into double digit territory. And gold has always been an accurate barometer of that inflation. Welcome to another RTD interview. Today, I'm excited to have returning guests, Mr. David Garofalo. He's the CEO and president of Gold Royalty Corp, precious metal-focused royalty and streaming company. And today, he's joined us to share his thoughts on the economy, precious metal space, as well as opportunities in the royalty area. So, David, welcome back to RTD interviews. Thanks for having me on again, Michael. Well, I appreciate you for taking time again to uh, sit down with us here at RTD. I'm definitely looking forward to getting an update as to what's happening with Gold Royalty Corp. But before we dive into that, for those that might be new to the community, can you give us a quick back, a uh, little drop of your background and how you arrived at this point in your career? Sure. Well, I have 32 years of experience on the mine development and operating side. Most recently, I ran Gold Corp, uh, which I merged with Newmont back in 2019 to create the world's biggest gold company by market cap and production. But I have been a prolific mind builder in my career and really have switched gears and now financing mine development through our royalty vehicle, Gold Royalty Corp. All right. Thank you for sharing that. And so uh, beginning of 2022, last time we spoke, it was uh, towards the end of last year. And of course, a lot of things was happening in the macro as well as just the local economies. And so I'm curious to get your take on where we're at now, according to what you're keeping an eye on. So we're middle of February-ish. And so at this current moment, what are some things you're keeping an eye on? What's, what concerns you? What excites you? Give us a little bit as to what you're what you're saying. Well, I would say what um, excites me is the price action we see in gold. It seems to have breached uh, key technical levels, and I still believe that gold will be three thousand dollars an ounce uh, by the end of this year. So we're talking about months, not years away. And what's driving that is uh, what concerns me, which is significant inflation and excesses in the markets generally, in the economy generally, as a result of over a dozen years of increased money supply. That's resulting in uh, really extended valuations in the general equity markets and significant inflation. And we've seen headline numbers now in inflation approach 40 year highs. And I would say that significantly understates the reality on the ground. Um, if you're buying food, if you're buying fuel, if you're putting a roof over your head, it's not single digit seven and a half percent inflation. It's deeply into double digit territory. And gold has always been an accurate barometer of that inflation. Okay, so thank you for sharing that. So, you know, it caught me by surprise there. I wasn't anticipating on hearing the number such as 3000 this year. And so based upon the, 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 the background that you laid towards that price there, I assume that, you know, you see this happening within the, the, the latter part of the year, given the fact we got the Federal Reserve looking to do some things early, the tightening, the hike rates and things like that. I'm assuming that it's going to come out of nowhere or going to be a progressive, uh, you know, upward climb towards that 3000 mark. Well, when sentiment changes and capital flows, it tends to happen in quick, violent fashion. Uh, not unlike what we saw, for example, in the copper space recently, when copper was plumbing lows a couple of years ago and now has achieved new highs. That's a result of the realization in the market that, hey, we need a lot of metal to decarbonize our economy. There's a lot of copper that goes into electric vehicles. And guess what? There hasn't been any investment in new mine capacity for many, many years. So there's a significant supply squeeze. I'd say it's the same sort of phenomenon on the gold side. People are realizing now that inflation is here to stay. It's likely to accelerate. Real interest rates will continue to dive deeper and deeper into negative territory. It doesn't matter what Jerome Powell does with the nominal rates, with the you know, federal uh, central bank rate. If it goes up a quarter point here, a quarter point there, it doesn't matter if inflation continues to go up. It'll drive real interest rates deeper and deeper into negative territory and make gold much more attractive. Inflation is insidious. Every day that you leave your capital sitting in an account, 
Inflation eats away 15 to 20% purchasing power every single year. Gold preserves value. And in a rising inflationary environment, gold goes up in value and actually adds to your capital pile. Mm. Well, thanks for sharing that. So t- typically, based upon the scenarios you're laying out there, that I assume if the Federal Reserve is trapped, they can't do much to really stop inflation based upon what information you share with us. By them looking to, uh, I guess, talk about removing support, do you see them coming back in and having to do some things to, I guess, fight the narrative? Because also the current equities markets usually go parallel with the amount of accommodative policies that's been provided last decade plus. How will all that shake out <laughs> in, in your opinion? Yeah, well, that, that's what makes it so difficult for the Federal Reserve to be overly aggressive on interest rate hikes because they're concerned about the level of equity markets. They shouldn't be. That's not what a central bank is supposed to do. They're supposed to focus on keeping inflation contained, low, um, sustainable. And that really hasn't been the case since really the credit crisis over a dozen years ago. It's just been a coordinated global effort to increase money supply across the world. And as a result, we've seen inflation pop up everywhere in the world, uh, significant record inflation, not unlike what we saw in the late 1970s. And we had an inflation fighter come into the Federal Reserve back then, Paul Volcker, who started to raise nominal interest rates in 1979. But gold galloped for at least a couple of years after that as, as a result of accelerating inflation. So really, the, the Federal Reserve is a lagging indicator of inflation as opposed to a leading one. They're fighting what's already happened, and it takes years to tame inflation, particularly after a dozen years of excessive money supply. Mm-hmm. So I think, again, like happened in the late 1970s, we're going to achieve new highs in gold. In 1981, it hit $8.50 an ounce. In, in $1981, if you inflation adjust that to 2022, that's $3,000 an ounce. So I'm not pulling that number out of the hair. That's the previous cyclical real high for gold. And we're in the same type of predicament that we were in the 1970s with accelerating inflation. Hmm, interesting. Now, uh, to factor in that, you know, we have the concerns of the debt market, you know, bond yields are increasing, a lot of people saying inverted yield curve, people paying attention to metrics like that. And they say, usually when that happens, we anticipate a recession. Now, say, for example, something of that magnitude does come this year. Typically, there's a sell off and things tend to you know, correct or whatever. We know we have a lot of asset bubbles. Gold, I mean, is that something that could impact that or will it completely decouple and go the complete opposite given the circumstances? Well, you know, that that um, res, rising of interest rates that we saw in the late 70s and early 80s and, and continued well into the 80s led to a, a long, long recession, a bear market in the equity markets. I don't see why we wouldn't have a repeat of that phenomenon now. Gold did extremely well in order to preserve wealth in that type of environment. We have the same sort of excesses in our equity markets today. Uh, where multiples, you know, whether it's price to earnings, price to cash flow, have been extended beyond recognition, uh, beyond any precedent we've seen. There's likely to be a severe correction. We've seen um, asset bubbles like uh, cryptocurrencies really back physically by nothing. Uh, there, that's a huge momentum trade. There's likely to be a correction. Digital currencies are here to stay, but the question is, what is a rational valuation for those those currencies? And I think we're a long way away from that. So that kind of capital flight will go back into gold, which has been a currency for 4,000 years, physically backed, uh, uh, indestructible, recognized as a currency for four millennia. That's really where the capital is going to go in order to preserve uh, valuation in a panic market. And I do think we're heading into a panic market. We're going to be in a very deep recession with general equity markets correcting severely. Interesting. Uh, so, so when it comes to the mining space, given the fact that there's a there's a desire to fly to flee for safety in the actual meadows themselves, I'm, a t- I'm assuming that the mining space would also typically do well, given the fact that people will be wanting exposure to that as well as physical. Yeah, for sure. I think the way to look at this is, yes, you can buy the physical and and I think everybody should have some gold in their portfolio, physical gold in their portfolio, whether it's physically owning the gold, having it in storage or owning the ETF on the New York Stock Exchange, which is physically backed, that, that's a proxy for owning the physical yourself and probably more cost effective. Mm-hmm. The other way is to buy the mining equities. And my concern right now for the producers is that they are not immune from inflation that we're seeing in the general economy. So their costs are going to be upwardly dynamic. That'll undermine the leverage proposition you're looking for in mining equities. Not unlike what happened 10 years ago coming out of the credit crisis when gold went up 140%. The gold equities, uh, the producers actually underperformed the commodity. They were only up about 66%. Mm -hmm. The companies that did well in that environment, in an inflationary environment, 
uh, were the streamers and the royalty companies. They were up 350%. So there was a lot of cost pressure a dozen years ago, 10, 12 years ago. And I see that same sort of cost pressure now in the mining side. And that's why after 30 years of building and operating mines, I've positioned myself running a royalty and streaming company because the way they work is we get a fixed percentage of the revenue uh, from a mine site and we have no exposure to operating capital costs. So we get a percentage of the top line and we also get any upside in their exploration success. So if the, un the under operator actually explores and grows their deposits geologically, we get a, a royalty on that extension as well. So we have upside to the gold price, upside to expiration, but completely insulated from operating capital costs because we only get a percentage of the top line. But that's a clear distinction between actually having ex direct exposure to the mining space Right, as opposed to having exposure to the royalty side of things. Interesting there. So yeah, because my, my my next question was going to be something around the, the, the energy side of things with oil prices being of concern. And a lot of people were throwing out some very large numbers of oil prices. So I'm assuming on the mining side, that would definitely impact them. But yet on the royalty side, you're not necessarily going to be impacted with that because you get yours off the top in, in a sense. That, that's exactly right. So I see labor pressures and, it, and we've all seen, um, you know, uh, the, the advent of uh, significant turnover in, in the workforce and people quitting their jobs and changing their lifestyles. We're seeing that in the mining space. It, retaining labor is going to be an increasing challenge. We're going to see uh, labor costs climb. We're going to see energy prices climb. And, and mining, at the end of the day, is an energy intensive business. We have big equipment, big plants, and whatnot that require a lot of energy. So, labor and energy is going to be a key driver of operating costs uh, within the mining industry. Insulating yourself from that while getting optimum leverage to the gold price mm -hmm. is really why the royalty and streaming business makes the most sense. Interesting. Now, speaking of which, you know, as the labor pressures and whatnot, you know, I know over the last two years has been very chaotic given all the restrictions, lockdowns, and things like that. And of course, in the Canadian region, you know, there's a lot of activity happening up there now on, on the positive as well as negative. I would assume overall health of the mining space outside of the economic conditions is fairly healthy and deposits are still able to be brought you know from the ground and things like that well that's that's the challenge actually i, I would say that the balance sheets in the mining business have never been stronger uh, after half a dozen years or more of deleveraging returning cash flow to shareholders the, the, the companies are actually in very good shape financially. Mm -hmm. What they're not in good shape in is the, this, uh, the state of their reserves. Gold reserves are down 40% since their peak in 2012 mm -hmm. because the industry, as a result of deleveraging and returning capital to shareholders, simply has not reinvested back in exploration of mine development to replace depleting reserves. So that's a significant challenge for the industry. It's declining leverage to the gold price as a result of less reserves in the ground. And if they're not finding it through their exploration efforts, which they haven't been, they're going to have to buy it. So we have, and we will continue to see a big pickup in M&A activity, companies merging with each other, to replace depleting reserves. And that's why, for example, you know, I, I engineered the merger between Newmont and Gold Corp and Barrick and Rangold uh, did a merger just before that it, because all four of those companies were facing declining reserves, a cliff in their production. And as a result of combining with each other, they were able to get a critical mass of reserves, a critical mass of operations that could uh, result in sustainable production. So again, if they're not finding the ground, they're going to have to, uh, to, to basically replace the reserves through mergers and acquisitions. Interesting, interesting. So let's dive into a little bit of the royalty side of things. And so uh, I think I've had one or two other gentlemen on giving us an education because this entire sector rather is relatively new to us because I'm a heavy, you know, if you can't hold it, you don't own it type of guy. Uh, and so definitely I, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear about the distinction between owning the miners as well as the royalty space. Cause it seems like there's, you know, you're kind of shielded from the, the fluctuations in that space there. So for gold royalty corp, uh, for those that might be new, of course, give us a little bit of the, the background origins, things like that. And uh, where we at? Well, we only IPO'd in March of last year, so been in existence for 11 months, and we raised $90 million US in our IPO. We started with 14 royalties on really high-quality development stage assets through the Americas, and then acquiring that currency through our IPO, we then started to roll up some of our competitors. It's highly fragmented in that smaller cap space, and we thought there's a role for somebody to go out and consolidate these companies and create critical mass, and we bought three companies last year, Ely Gold, mm -hmm. Golden Valley, and Abitibi. And as a result, we expanded our royalty portfolio from 14 to 191 royalties, and we effectively quadrupled our size from our IPO. And in doing so, we now have a very attractive, diversified portfolio of 191 royalties, six that are in production, cash flowing currently, 11 in construction, 
and then a broad array of royalties from early stage exploration right through to feasibility that provide us a lot of organic growth. And in fact, over the next three years, um, by analyst estimates, we have the highest compounded, compounded average growth rate and revenue in the industry, uh, over 60%. Mm -hmm. And it's because of that growth and revenue, we actually introduced the dividend um, ten, you know, 10 months after our existence, after our IPO. We're now yielding just under 1%, paying a penny per quarter. And I have a high degree of confidence given our revenue projections that we have the basis to start to increase our, our, our dividend over the next uh, several years. All right. Now, I also was reading up on some of the, uh, I guess, recent updates, and it looks like, you know, you guys have uh, intentions on acquiring Elemental Royalty Corp as well, as well. And that's, I guess, in the making or give us a little bit of information on that. So that would be the fourth company we acquire in, in less than a year in existence. And so we launched a, um, a acquisition proposal to their shareholders directly um, in early January. Um, and we hope to be able to close that transaction in April. And that would add another nine royalties. So bring us to 200 royalties, bring in some additional cash from royalties into the mix and also bring in a complementary jurisdiction in Australia. We have 75% of our current portfolio concentrated in Nevada and Quebec the two best jurisdictions in which to operate in the world because of uh, the prolific gold districts those are, but also because of their low political risk and low regulatory risk. And so Australia gives us another tier one jurisdiction within the portfolio and continues to diversify, uh, was already a very broadly diversified portfolio. And that's one of the other advantages of the royalty and streaming space. You know, We have a lot more diversification than an operating company can hope to have. Even the biggest uh, operating gold companies in the world have no more than a dozen, 15 operations within their portfolio. We have 191 assets going to 200 with the elemental acquisition. That's a lot of diversification mm -hmm. uh, relative to what the operators can hope to achieve. Now, when it comes to the royalty side of things, I assume that all royalty comes are not created equally as far as there being some distinctions or is, is that not the case? Or how do you, how can you determine a good one from not the best and that, that type of you know metrics there? Well, you know, it's not a huge universe, but what I would say is th there's two distinct uh, categories of royalty companies. There's the blue chip, large scale companies, and there's three of them. There's only three of them. It's Wheat and Precious Metals, Franco Nevada, and Royal Gold. Those are large cap. Mm -hmm. And then there's everybody else that's sub $2 billion, smaller cap. Um, and there's quite a few of them, um, but many of them trade by appointment. They're very illiquid. They don't have access to capital. They're challenged in terms of continuing to grow their portfolio. And so we came in with the thesis that these companies at the smaller scale needed to consolidate to create scale and also hopefully create a mid-tier company where none exists currently. So by aggressively consolidating the spaces we've done, we've achieved scale very quickly. We've achieved diversification in our portfolio. We've achieved cash flow. We're starting to pay a dividend. And ultimately, uh, through our consolidation efforts, we hope to achieve a market cap somewhere in the 3 to $5 billion range, mm -hmm. which is big enough to matter to institutional investors, but small enough to grow. Uh, with any individual royalty acquisition. The large cap companies are challenged to grow. They're so big, you know, 20, $30 billion market cap, any individual acquisition they make simply doesn't move the needle. If we can uh, achieve that, that mid-tier status to be big enough to matter, but small enough to grow, we're likely to attract uh, a significant premium multiple relative to our peers. Now, for someone who might have interest in finding out more, like, is there any analyst or any way they can keep an eye on things to really see the progress uh, of Gold Royalty in particular? Well, we're broadly covered uh, by three institutions right now, H.C. Wainwright, Haywood, and BMO. And in fact, in the case of H.C. Wainwright and Haywood, we're their top royalty pick for 2022. Uh, so, uh, and, and on an average basis, those three analysts have um, a target price that's over 50% um, higher than where we're currently trading. All right. So for those that might have interest, um, they could always go to your website as well. Can you give us, I uh, guess, where you guys are traded at and some of the details and whatnot? Of course, I'll put it down below and definitely uh, you know, encourage people to take a look at it. Sure. We're G-R-O-Y on the New York Stock Exchange, G-Roy. And our uh, website is goldroyalty.com. So easy to remember. Sounds good. Well, David, once again, I thank you for giving us an update as to what's happening with Gold Royalty, as well as sharing your, your thoughts and opinions on where we're at and where we're heading. And I think uh, that 3000 uh, gold mark definitely sounds good to a lot of ears out here, I'm assuming. And then also, just for the sake of curiosity, if gold is at 3000 where would you see silver falling in line with that, uh, you know, that price of, of gold? Well, it's an excellent question. Right now, the gold price to silver price ratio is somewhere in the 75 plus to one range. Mm -hmm. In a bull market, 
uh, when the precious metals are running, typically the gold price to silver price ratio goes down to 40 to one, which means that if gold is at $3,000 an ounce, silver is easily north of $100. Interesting. All right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you to that and have you back on later this year. We'll see where we're at. But uh, David, I thank you once again for joining us on RT Interviews and definitely looking forward to you know staying uh, in tune with what you guys have going on. So thanks for joining us again. Thank you, Michael.